Okay, welcome back to part two of my lecture series. <clears throat> Let me get all situated here. Uh, so these these lectures, really, I'm doing them. Why am I doing these at all? It's like, where is this stuff coming from? Aren't I just taking my conclusion and proceeding from there and making it fit the material that's there? Well, I don't think so. That's that's why I'm doing all this. I think that. If you go through these missions and you take what I'm saying here and make all the comparisons, I think it all bears itself out. So missions five and six are what I'm going to talk about here. And the reason I'm doing all this is because I think this is kind of the proof. This is the proof in the pudding of how the Phantom Pain really does show us the return to Camp Omega. It shows us all the stuff that they said it really kind of was going to do. It doesn't do it literally. It does it symbolically. So like... We're doing the stuff, it's just we don't recognize it because the names and locations and time period have all changed. Also, uh, it's not really 1984. Excuse me. That's another video I'm going to do a whole what year is it in the Phantom Pain video and just go over all the stuff. That'll be that'll be more of like a proper video. I'm going like, to have to get a lot of stuff from different games for that. But uh, that kind of stuff, you know... The, the game being sort of like out of time. It's something that comes, it's very like inherent to the Phantom Pain and the whole 1984 thing. Uh, because if you've read the book 1984, you, you know that one of the things that the Ministry of Truth controls is what year is it? And what, you know, that's one of the core things of the, of the movie The Matrix is that the people in The Matrix don't know what year it really is. And so that's, that's I think that's going on in Metal Gear for Venom Snake, at least, during the time period. Uh, the big support of that is the pause scene. Anyways, none of that happens in these missions. <laughs> I just wanted to bring that up, uh, all because I think this is... Mission 6 is where we start to really get into... The, the really This is where the heavier stuff starts to come. Um, and, oh gosh. Mission 6, it's... You, some, I'm probably going to lose some people here. That's that's also why I'm saying all this. I think I know I'm going to lose some some people when I talk about missions five and six because when we get into missions five and six, we get into relating the characters in the Phantom Pain to the characters from Peace Walker and just the characters we know in Metal Gear as a whole. And so essentially what I'm going to be saying here is some of these characters aren't who they appear to be. And I think some people... Well, I don't want to get too personal, but I think some people are very invested in some of these characters and the identities that they've crafted from what they've seen of these characters, but I want to inject the idea that these identities that we know are actually multiple characters playing the same assumed identity in different time periods, specifically Miller. That's who we're going to get to talking about. But first, before we get to talking about Miller, we got to talk about Sokolov. Now, mission five, over the fence. We go rescue a Soviet engineer. He's the bionics engineer. Now, there's a thing that happens in the Phantom Pain, or in uh, in Phantom Limbs. That the, the, the game kind of doesn't explain itself. It just kind of does it, and you just kind of have to get it. Or if you don't get it, well, you're going to have a bad time until you do get it. And then you're going to have a great time when you do get it. And you'll be like, oh my god. So that's And that's what this whole experience is about. So, we know when Venom starts that mission, he's the very first time you do it, his left hand is the red bionic arm. However, at the end of the previous mission, the prologue, when you're in the, the cut scenes in the, in the boat with Ocelot, he's giving you... You've got your, your old hook arm that you had on at the end of the hospital scenario on on this table, and Ocelot slaps down this kind of ivory-colored, four-fingered bionic arm. And you're like, what the heck is this? You never get to use it in the game at all. You never see it again, actually. When Phantom Limb starts up, Venom's looking at his arm, and it's the red one already. So it's like, where did this ivory one go? Well, that ivory one is what he actually had the first time. That is what was really going on. Is he's looking at this four-fingered arm he had. He's getting used to it. The red arm is put there as another recontextualization of future details put over past details to explain things in a different way. Um, we know that we don't have the ability to develop, to develop a, a red arm until we get the bionics engineer that we get in over the fence. So 
this red arm from phantom limbs is a hallucination. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier about things being hallucinations in a uh, um, hero's way. So those hallucinations are really kind of like future contexts superimposed into the past via the system. And because the phantom pain is all experienced via a, a kind of VR hallucination dream. That's, that's really where the hallucination aspect comes into the phantom pain, I think. Uh, but I also think these missions are real things that did occur as well. It's just what we experience is a VR recreation of the stuff. So what happened was... In the Phantom Pain, we go get this Soviet engineer who's actually Sokolov. We know the bionics guy, he's, he's really like the machine maker. And the only guy who's really doing that in the past was Sokolov. And then Huey Emmerich shows up in, in Peace Walker. And he's got Sokolov's entire skill set and Sokolov's just gone. And we never see Sokolov again. Like, really? And people just, just go along with it. I'm pretty sure Huey Emmerich in... Peace Walker was Sokolov. Um, and then so for the Phantom Pain, he's taken on this identity of... He's not even really a main character. He's just some schmuck on the base. He doesn't even really get a part. Uh, Kaz talks about the stuff he does, and Ocelot talks about the stuff he does. But this guy himself, he's just some schmuck. And you can get like a whole bunch of them on your base, too. You can replay the mission. As a way of saying, this guy is not really that important. Um, and the reason he's not important is because of the stuff he did during the mutiny. Now, what does this refer to back in 75 then? So, this Soviet engineer being Sokolov, it's kind of hard to say, actually. It seems like it may be, because I, th I think we actually rescue Sokolov himself for the, the whole uh, 75 operation. Because I actually think it was 75 and 76. Uh, in the mission Code Talker. I think that uh, Code Talker stands in for Sokolov. Um, I'll, I'll get to it, but it's possible that we that Snake actually rescues Sokolov here. But I don't know. I, I'm, it's, 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 we'll, we'll get into it because things get kind of fuzzy. This, this could be kind of a repeat of the whole Zadornov thing where we rescue him and then he escapes and then we have to recapture him. Or it could be that... Because, uh, where is he? He's at Walk Send. He's at the combat platform. Now, okay. The reason that I really think this guy is Sokolov and I think it relates to Sokolov is because the Walk Send barracks with its whole destroyed building there kind of relates to the building where we first see Sokolov in Virtuous Mission, okay? And now what's the script for Virtuous Mission? Well, Snake infiltrates the jungle, he crosses a bridge, he makes his way to this abandoned, ruined building, and he meets with his target. And then he has to, like, hey, he has a whole encounter with the enemy. So if you do over the fence a certain way, you can deploy, and instead of going over the hill, you can actually go on down and go to a bridge and go over a bridge which is that stone bridge which is the same kind of model as the one that's destroyed in the prologue and it comes up again and again in this game and this bridge you cross it and then you go into this area where there's this ruined structure and you meet this this guy in there and you fault him from out of the middle of the building so that's that's probably what really happened was snakes snuck in to his own R&D platform essentially or wherever this Sokolov guy was, or maybe he was some guy who worked for Sokolov. I don't know. Um, oh, also note that there's where the bridge goes over here, there's a dried up river bed underneath. So this river stands in for the, the river in Virtuous Mission, in, in Salino Yarsk, actually. It's just here in Afghanistan, the river's all dried up. So there's a dried river bed that goes all through Afghanistan. And that kind of is like, you could think of it as the remains of the River of Sorrow from Selino Yarsk. It's kind of in a way implying that that river goes through our base. Like, the offshore base. Meaning that maybe it wasn't actually an offshore base. Maybe this whole offshore platform thing was just a cover. And maybe it was like an island with rivers and stuff like that. Or an island chain even. You know, with bridges going in between them. There's lots of possibilities. I don't know if any one of them is the real one. I think maybe all of them are real. 
at different points in time, it's complicated. Anyways, so the dried up riverbed, the bridge, the building, it all suggests this parallel to Virtuous Mission. And this guy's like so club. But this tower that we're, we're evacuing him from, because this whole ruined building, it kind of has a tower structure to it. It's Waxin Barracks, and I said earlier the Waxin Barracks stands in for the combat platform. Well, if you look at the combat platform and you compare it to the command platform, they're the same. They're towers. There's two towers, actually. And we know the command platform of Peace Walker Space was a single tower. So this implies that there was a second tower, essentially. And that was where Sokolov was being held. And so Snake sneaks in there and evacs Sokolov. Now, I'm guessing he, he must have been taken back to the land base, I, it's kind of hard for me to imagine that Snake's sneaking into his own base here and also using it as his way of, like, where, like, like where his, where's Zero? You know, where's his support? I think it's actually back on the, <laughs> on the land base where Big Boss is. I think they're doing this kind of right underneath his nose. But also maybe doing it for him, maybe still. I, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to say. They may not have fully understood the, the betrayal yet. I th- I'm pretty sure they knew, though. And that they were hiding this from Big Boss. And so Sokolov is probably evac from this offshore facility back to the onshore facility. That's probably what happens at this point. Um, and so this is like, again, this is like another reference to what happens at the end of the Peace Walker main, or the, the Ground Zero's main event. Skullface goes and gets Huey from the tower and leaves with him. That's exactly what we do here in Over the Fence. So Venom is already here compared to Skullface. We're doing the stuff that we're being told that Skullface did. And you'll learn later, Skullface, the persona itself, is entirely a creation of Fox. It's a recontextualization, a character that he creates that entirely does not exist until he sort of like tells its story in the past, and what he does is he takes the stuff that Big Boss does during his mutiny, this is the evil stuff, essentially, and he credits all that to Skullface, and then he becomes Skullface and puts on the mask himself. But every other time we see Skullface, that's also literally him. So we, when we see Skullface, that's a, sort of a way of erasing what Naked Snake originally did. Does that make sense? So, like, everything that we hear Skullface doing on tapes is not what Big Boss did. It's a recontextualization by Fox of what Big Boss did. It's kind of a censor, but it's really he's adding context. And I'll get to it all later, but there, this all ties in with everything, every detail in the tapes, everything that we see about Skullface do. In fact, what happened in Ground Zeroes was Skullface... Ground Zeroes is itself a recreation of what happened during the Camp Omega mutiny. So Skullface is actually Fox. Skullface gets into the chopper, and they all take their patches off and throw it out the window... Well, those patches going out the window, Skullface's patch is Fox, actually. So, like, he becomes that patch. He gets thrown out the window, and then it falls through the camera frame. And, like, as it's falling through the camera frame, then another one rises up, and it's Snake with the Fox patch on his arm. That's Skullface has literally jumped out of the, the helicopter like Chico, and it was cut, and then he rises up on the cliff. It's, it's literally, it's like his story in kind of a microcosm. So Venom is Skullface, essentially. So Skullface is a self-made recontextualization of our own past. It's it's a way of coping with our own trauma from all of this. It's it's a way that we can understand the trauma because it's so like uh, it's it's like, you know, the way that, that trauma victims need to sometimes externalize what's happened to them in order to understand it. Like you can't really approach your own trauma honestly sometimes just because of your your brain working in, and because of memory and you know all that kind of stuff so anyways so the combat and command structures are like the same thing so in other words walks in barracks is kind of like just an extension of a Vialo village it's like they're kind of related here um there's, you know, there's, there's towers there. There's prisoner cells. We, we rescued some prisoners in Vialo Village. Now there's prisoners here. So this tells us that there were probably prisoners kept all over this place, you know. <laughs> um, this all also relates to the admin sector. This is all kind of more parallel, an extended parallel for the admin sector of, of Camp Omega. And yeah, take a sip here, excuse me. 
And I know I'm kind of flying through this, but I'm I'm trying to get through these quick and dirty, like I said, and, and just get the info out there, and I'll talk more about it in the more uh, extended videos that I'll be doing later. Okay, so, now then, if that's mission five, we go get Sokolov. Mission six, where the beast sleep, takes us to a whole new area of Afghanistan. And this isn't on our base. Um, essentially, we go, we start at the Mountain Relay Base, and we go through there, and then we go to Desmase Laman. Yeah. My brain just did a whole thing there, excuse me. So, Desmase Laman is like another recreation of the abandoned sector of Camp Omega. The, uh, the Mountain Relay Base is like another recreation of the main sector. Note how they're building a big bridge here. And remember all the stuff I talked about with bridges and intel and communications and how what we're doing when we get here is we go over the bridge. Ideally, you, you deal with the guards, you go over the bridge, and then you rescue the Hamid survivor. Um, there's jeeps. There's caves. You're in Afghanistan. You should be thinking of Mission 30, Skull Face, the, the Jeep Ride with Skull Face. Now, I know the Jeep Ride with Skull Face, everybody's like, imagine uh, planning this whole thing for nine years and g delivering your big speech that you planned the whole time to the wrong guy. <laughs> Isn't it so stupid? Ha ha ha. Like, that's really not what happened, I promise people. Hideo Kojima is a better writer than that. When you say that you think that that's what happened, you're saying that's what you think of Hideo Kojima's writing, and you're making a fool of yourself, and I beg you please to reconsider your position on Skullface's speech in the Jeep, because this game's about to show you some stuff. Now, the Hamid survivor's being driven around in a Jeep, so that's what happens in, in 75 on Outer Heaven. A lot of the, the prisoners are being held captive and driven around in Jeeps and being asked, like, what the heck's going on? So they're, they're being tortured and interrogated for intel. Essentially, boss has taken over, and now he's like, I need to know where all of Zero's secrets are. Tell me. Who's this Hamid survivor? This guy who's mute. Excuse me. Well, just to, just to tell you, this is the original Kazuhira Miller. Kazuhira Miller is a created identity, false persona, for the real person that we know of as Roy Campbell. Roy Campbell was essentially Cypher's man from the U.S. Army. He was he's he had familial connections, I think, in the U.S. Army. And Roy Campbell was a real person who, basically, I think he he got in with Cipher. He was probably sent originally by the Army to go investigate Cipher, and then I think Cipher sort of like just pulled him in, and they they sort of turned him. Um, I think that literally what that literally means is like he was given the parasite. He became one of the the greater structure of these parasite people because cipher are all actually humans melded with parasites. They're not actually human. Uh, they're like humans plus parasites. Uh, but the parasites are all sort of like perfect recreations of humans and the evolution of humans. So it's complicated. They're kind of like ludens, actually. You could call them ludens. Let's just call them ludens. So cipher people. Um, they have Kaz, they have Roy Campbell, and he's like their commander at the end of Peace Walker. And then there's the whole betrayal with, Z with the Zero stuff in Cypher. And Kaz, you know, you remember the scene in Peace Walker where Kaz tells Big Boss casually that Paz was actually a, a secret Cypher spy and he knew the whole time. And Boss is just kind of like casually like, Kaz, I'm so disappointed. And it doesn't make any sense as to like why his reaction would be that way. Well, that's because what we're seeing is a probably a recontextualized scene. I bet once Boss figured out that Kaz was working with Zero, he probably figured that out on his own and got really pissed off and then went and captured the real Kaz Miller, Roy Campbell, and started torturing for, for information and replaced him, since Kaz Miller's just an assumed identity, just replaced him with his own guy. So I think that the Cos Miller at the end of Peace Walker is not Roy Campbell anymore. Like like Hot Coleman was another proxy for the real Zero. I think that Cos Miller essentially became a proxy 
for someone else at that point. And I think Big Boss was using him as a proxy at first. So in that way, you see how I'm saying uh, Snake's XO at that point was really Zero. And Zero's XO used to be Big Boss. And now Big Boss has taken over, taken his own XO out, and replaced him with just a shell, essentially. So that's what's going on here. So this Hamid survivor, the Hamid, the freedom fighters, they are the zero side of the whole equation, essentially. So the, the Soviets stand in for the side of Big Boss's mutiny in Afghanistan, in the Phantom Pain. And these Hamid survivors, the Afghanistan freedom fighters, they're the ones who stand in for Zero's original cipher people. who are, They're really the ones that are rightfully supposed to be in charge of this whole thing because they've, they're the ones that have continuity going back. Once we learn more about Big Boss's origins, we learn that he, did, he wasn't actually one of the original founders of this whole organization, and he just came into it later. And it was almost like they, them bringing him in was like a way of sort of like trying to help him because all this stuff had been done to him. It, it, and that's why he did it to Chico. So anyways. So Cos Miller's being tortured. Oh, also, this the way we can relate this to Cos Miller is via the stuff we were shown in Ground Zero's promotional stuff. We know that the torture of this Hamid survivor matches the animations of a torture were seen uh, in the, a promotion for Ground Zeroes where uh, one of the soldiers there takes one of the prisoners dressed in yellow with a bag over his head and like holds the bag back and then dumps a canteen in his mouth to waterboard him. Kind of like a impromptu field waterboarding. It's, it's apparently a pretty common technique. You'll see all throughout this game actually in different areas where prisoners are kept a chair and then a sack next to the chair, and then a bucket next to the sack in the chair. So they were it was like a standard procedure for them. That is repeated in OKB Zero, uh, in a bunch of other indoor places where you can tell they hold prisoners uh, at uh, Yakuubu. There's several rooms. They're just that's just apparently all that they did was just waterboarded people. I know, sick stuff. But we're saying that this is what the mutiny people were doing. The people during Big Boss's whole rebellion. They were all assholes. They were all heels that had turned into like war criminals and monsters. And the people from the Zero side, the freedom fighters, the Hamid here, represented by the Hamid, they were the ones trying to fight against them and stop them. So Roy Campbell was probably a good guy who was secretly planted in Big Boss's organization before he became Big Boss in order to like keep tabs on him so that he couldn't go off and do crazy stuff. Because, uh, like I so said, we find out Big Boss's history is really dark. We're told all this stuff about Skullface's history going back to... He was probably the one who assassinated Stalin, and he worked for the USSR. That all happened to Naked Snake. That all happened to the original Big Boss. Uh, people use this phrase, the real Big Boss, a lot, and they, we need to stop using it. The real Big Boss phrase, that's a trap, because there are several real Big Bosses. It depends on what time you're talking about Big Boss. If you're talking about Big Boss in 1975, the only real Big Boss... Was naked. The guy was formerly known as Naked Snake. Jack. Jack is the guy we know of. But after he was taken down, which I think happened in 76, the big boss role was assumed by the guy we know as Snake, who's Fox. So he became the real big boss, but he wasn't the original big boss. So when people talk about the real big boss not being, like, Medic's not the real big boss, they're actually wrong. Medic is the real big boss because... Ishmael Big Boss, no, Old Fox, passes down the role of Big Boss to his younger self for the whole Outer Heaven incident in 95, which was all like meant to bring that whole mutiny thing to a close. And Zanzibar Land was just sort of like the wrapping up of the extra stuff. And really so was Shadow Moses and the Big Shell, which we'll get to. Holy s***. Uh, but anyways... Uh, where did the beast sleep? Hamid survivor, Cos Miller. He's being asked to tell them where this hidden location is. For the, the honeybee. What the heck is the honeybee? The new weapon. Well, I said in the last videos, the new weapon that's being R&D'd is, is Fox. He's the next generation of super soldier. 
in the phantom pain. For Big Boss, it was just whoever was the next the basis for the next generation of Super Soldier who was actually Fox. So he was making drones of Fox. This is, I think, where the skull units came from. I think, essentially, Big Boss was wanting to make these drone units that he could control. And that's where the, the skulls, the frog units, and all these other sort of, like, systems of controlling not really people, but like people looking things. So also, I think this plays into how the B&B core are controlled. And possibly, Foxhound themselves were subject to this early on in, in their history. I think Big Boss created these super soldiers and had literal control over them. Uh, like, I also, I think Chico's one of them. Uh, we'll get to it. So, the Skulls, like I said are his new super soldier that he was probably R&Ding back then. And he used, I think, uh, he was going to use, I think his plan was to use someone as like the basis for his super soldier program. And then he was going to give them the parasites and then forcibly make them go through a transformation, essentially. But I, I don't think he had the full picture figured out because like I said, what we see with Skullface doing and the bombs and paws and all that stuff was recontextualization. So I think Skullface represents like what Fox does to, to, to show Big Boss's process of figuring this stuff out originally. So I think Big Boss figured out how to like create the Archaea by combining the DNA of the Pain and, um, and Volgan, and then he had, th took that Archaea and literally inserted it into, into Chico's head. Now we see it over here in, in the Phantom Pain, but imagine my head was mirrored, and that's, that's basically how he's presented in the Phantom... I'm sorry... We're showing him mirrored in Ground Zeroes. And in the Phantom Pain, it's over here. But you can imagine it just... They're they're both the same. It's just like it's in the same location. Imagine he has, he has two horns, you know? And they just like they just show one or the other in one of the games or the other. Also, the two horns thing and only showing one relates to how there are two foxes. There's two copies of them and you kind of only get to see one at a time. Also, how there's multiple big bosses it's, and multiple... You could say multiple snakes at sometimes, but you only get to see one. And I'll get to all that later. That comes up in the mission replays, actually. Uh, but So the skulls and their presence in the Phantom Pain, as we know in the earlier mission where they showed up, they they serve as kind of a way of recontextualizing the original scenario. So they, the skulls weren't really there in the, fan, in, uh, in the 75 version of this. Skullface wasn't really there either. So Hylanthropus definitely wasn't really there in 75. Um, what he does here, though, what Skullface does here when he shows up is a way of sort of predicting the future. He's essentially showing what's going to happen in the future because what happens is Fox goes and he finds... Well, first of all, let's go back to the caves. Um, the Hamid survivor points us towards these caves and hidden in the back of the caves is the honeybee. And the honeybee is a stand-in for Fox. It's the new weapons system. Uh, it's really Chico back in 75. Now, it's a hidden location, so this relates to the, the hidden diamonds from the previous mission and the mission tasks that we've already done a couple of times. And it's a diamond specifically because the diamond is a symbol for Big Boss's own DNA. His, his soldier genes are referred to as the diamond. Uh, they're unbreakable. Uh, they're the hardest substance known to man. Um, diamonds are symbolically kind of a stand-in in a lot of like older mythologies for like the hardest material you can make a thing out of you know uh, mithril is essentially like diamond adamantite is is like diamonds i think adamantite is like the greek word ancient greek word for diamond or something like that anyway um the diamond itself is a combination of the joy and the fear's DNA. So the joy and the fear are sort of like the parents that made Snake. And you could th you could think of it like, you know, how Snake was trained by the joy and how he looks so much like the fear. So it's like kind of the inner and outer aspects. And that's what the diamond represents. Um, so And that's how he's able to, like, do the stuff that the joy is able to do in Metal Gear Solid 3. That's how he's able to match her. He's, he's literally her son. Um... And like I said earlier, 
Chico is Fox is like a copy of Quiet. They're they're kind of the same thing. Quiet's not the same thing as the joy DNA wise. The joy is just the joy. Pause is the one that like represents all of the cobras really. Um, and pause is Chico essentially. That's the other thing, and you get that from the hallucinations too. But uh, so the hidden spot also relates to the pause hallucinations. So this hidden spot in the caves relates to the other hidden spots that we've seen so far. And remember how I mentioned how it was kind of weird to superimpose the, the Intel platform with Chico's cell, but then if you consider that diamond hidden behind it, like Pause's cell with the hidden tape there, the hidden spot is always kind of like where Pause is. It's like the, the, the hidden spot behind where, where Pause is, her cell. So this is where you have the hallucinations with Pause on the medical platform. And then the the cell that's your cell is where quiet is. So quiet's like in your cell and in the cell behind her where you, where she used to be is now just a, a reference to her essentially. <laughs> and it's really about yourself now. And that's why it's the Ground Zeroes tape, the music tape about Ground Zeroes that you find there back in the earlier mission. So you see how all these things are starting to tie together and these, as more context is laid out, it's constantly tying itself back to what you've just done and what you've done in the previous missions. And it's, and it's also tying itself to the future and it's superimposing different places and superimposing different characters. And it's all kind of artificial, but that's because that's how the parasites work is they are kind of artifice itself. Um, hopefully this is all kind of starting to make sense to some of y'all out here. Um, if not... I understand. It's this is like I said, these are like lectures that I would consider these like like graduate level college lectures on narrative analysis. Uh this stuff was not easy for me to figure out. I I feel like I intuitively knew this stuff the whole time, but didn't have the language for it essentially. And I've just kind of developed it finally. <laughs> and here we go. Um you could consider this kind of like a an add on to the linguistic parasite. Now I was considering going on, but my dog just came in here and she needs my attention. So I think that's going to be the end of lecture number two. Next time when I want to come back, we'll go to Red Brass. Uh, but just to wrap it up. So the hidden spot relates to all the other hidden spots and the hidden diamonds and the mission tasks and the pause hallucinations in yourself and your, your sense of identity. Um, so Hylanthropus shows up, recontextualizing the past events, grabs Fox turns them upside down, and then drops them. Because that's what that's symbolically what's about to happen to him. When Chico gets picked up from Camp Omega and taken out over to the, the sea and then turned upside down and dropped. That's his fall back out of the chopper, which it's cut, but there's references to it being cut everywhere it's recreated. Like like in the, the Max Bond quiet scene when it's raining and... Quiet floats down just and disappears just like pauses jump again, just like her jump in uh, cloaked in silence again. And Venom shows up on the deck magically. We don't see him jump out of the chopper, we don't see him falling through the air. He's just magically on the deck. That's Chico. Chico's essentially cut, but he's there. Just because he's cut doesn't mean he's cut from the story. As in, like, the actual what happened. What happened is what happened. The story includes the recontextualization. And the recontextualization cuts him for narrative reasons. Just like how every single Metal Gear Solid game has had details that have been quote-unquote cut. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 2 is full of this kind of stuff. After Fox dies applied, actually, in the story. Which, narratively, is there for very good reasons. Which we have to get to because the which well well I'll just tell you now the vocal cord parasite is fox die, it stands in for the same thing. The development of the vocal cord parasite and the linguistics of it is the same thing as fox die's development and the genetic targeting. Um, the linguistic parasite is actually just ciphers vocal control so that like when people have to say the word lolly lolly low and they can't say the word patriots that means they have the vocal cord parasite it's english <laughs> so it's not actually supposed to kill people the killing people part was like part of the development and the r&d of it <laughs> and like wasn't supposed to really be the main like what it really does so 
Mission 6, Where Do the Bees Sleep, is kind of actually your first real return to Camp Omega. Um, you're returning, you're going into the main camp, you're getting the intel on where Chico's being held, essentially, and cause is pointing to the location. And it's the real cause. And we rescue him here, but there's also a version of it where if you don't interfere, he goes to the uh, the caves and shows where he's being kept, and then he's shot. Presumably, that's what happened to the real Cos Miller. Snake probably couldn't interfere and couldn't just rescue Cos without betraying his whole operation, so he probably had to go no contact. No contact. That's why in the Ground Zero's promotions, that guy who's waterboarded and then is walking away and is shot, that's probably what happened to the real Roy Campbell, y'all. Big Boss's people tortured and murdered Roy Campbell, who was his XO, who was a guy who I think kind of trusted him. He was betrayed. And so I think that's why later on I get to how Zero takes the name of Campbell and takes on the persona of Roy Campbell. And I think he does that as a revenge against what Big Boss did here in this mutiny. So I think all the other people that we know of as Miller are all someone else. Yeah, you can think about that one, and I'll leave you with that. That's that's uh, Lecture 2 done, and since it's 2, peace out.